before starting, uh, how many of you are developing applications on cloud? Like it's a very typical question you will get actually. Okay. Uh, you might be having a favorite cloud platform uh, or some bad experiences with cloud. So today I am not going to talk uh, particularly about a platform. I'm going to touch uh, common cloud topics. So we won't be comparing any cloud like uh, what is best or Azure is better than AWS or AWS is better than Rackspace or anything, okay? <coughs> but what I'm trying to deliver is I want to deliver a common ground on what are the things actually you have to consider on developing a cloud application, okay? So that's the idea behind it. And cloud is being used by one of the buzzwords. Everywhere, everyone says cloud, cloud, cloud. Because even if they host a website somewhere from a hosting provider, it's a cloud. So let's try to define what is cloud. And let's see what are the things actually you have to consider, mainly developing applications on cloud. OK? So I think almost everyone is familiar with these cloud platforms. Like These are very few but maybe the major culprits. And I put the Arcas also in here. It's one of the public cloud platforms launched by SLT recently. OK? Sri Lanka Telecom. So how many of you have worked with uh, any of these technologies? I'm pretty sure mostly you might have worked with Azure, uh, AWS. Uh, anyone worked with Google Cloud Platform? OK, one hand. So one, okay, good. So like, what is the decision that how you choose a cloud platform? When say like a customer comes and he gives a requirement, okay, I want a shopping cart to be developed and it should run on cloud. And he has a very typical cloud sayings like, okay, I want uh, it to be on cloud because I want it to scale very well. I want it to run on demand based on metering. So those are very common requirements yet come again with ambiguity, right? Like, because IT is full of very confusing terms. So no one can really define what is scalability and what is flexibility of an application. Okay? So that ambiguity is again carried to the decision-making factors as well. So how do you really decide how can I choose Azure or AWS for a particular project? Cost is, of course, one of the considerations. But other than the cost, what is the decision-making factor? Like, people have worked with cloud, so just, I, I expect some answers, that's it. How, how do you decide that, okay, I want to put it in Azure, or I want to put it in AWS? How, how do you make the decision? Or oh, I want to use this particular service. Okay, so, and other thing is these days, everywhere you can see cloud. It's being overly used as well, something like this. Any problem you get with the, Software or application, they say, okay, put it in the cloud so it will be solved. <laughs> it's an easy job for the consultant, okay? And if a database is more than one million rows, solution is NoSQL, okay? So decisions are going in that way more than uh, tangible decision making, right? So we, we don't decide things based on reality. We decide based on ambiguity. So when there is something confusing, we think it is complex and it is good. So I'm just putting this image because I just wanted to make you realize actually how the decision making is going on when it comes to a cloud or non-cloud. Okay. So now let's move and see what is cloud. Cloud computing is, we don't really care actually, what is it? Okay, no one wants to read a definition. But cloud has these five characteristics, three service models and four deployment models. Actually it is defined by the NIST. Okay. So more than the definition, we look into that, what are those five characteristics, three service models, and uh, three, four deployment models. So before going into that, when it comes to characteristics, any platform to be noted as a cloud platform, it should have all five. Okay? So that's the definition given by the NIST. It should have all five. So say that you are developing a server, you have a bunch of servers, and you have an FTP endpoint to that, because I know people doing that, FTP endpoint to that server, and say I have a cloud storage. That's not supposed to be a cloud storage, okay? It's just an FTP endpoint to some servers. 
So all five should be there. Service model, it can be, they can offer all three or one or two. That's not a problem. Also, the deployment models also, it could be anything. Not, no need to be all four. But character should be all five should be there. So these are the characteristics. On-demand self-service, like you need to be able to serve yourself in the cloud without the intention of an IT uh, pro or IT person. Okay? And it should have a broad network access. What it means is not the huge bandwidth, the, the network access within the data center cluster, it should have a broad access. Okay? And resource pooling, this again, the, how the cloud is managed, the resource so should be pooled. For example, if you're creating a VM in Azure or a EC2 instance in AWS, you create, you run it for two hours and you delete it. So it's not, tech, you technically delete actually for hours. We see, but the resource has been pooled inside the data center. So the platform should be developed in that way to be considered as a cloud platform. And uh, rapid elasticity. So that's another major concern. Because I know like there are hosting providers who provide dedicated hosting. And also they market themselves as cloud providers, but they are not actually cloud based on the definition. And measured service. The service should be measured and metered based on the usage. That's why, that's where the key co term comes in the utility computing. You, you pay electricity, water for the amount uh, you, you use. So you use it for one hour, you pay only for that. So service should be measured, not only for the cost and also the service utilization also. So these five should be there to consider any cloud to be a cloud platform. Other than that, it's maybe half cloud or something. Okay. And three service models, actually, these are very highly overconfused and overly used three terms in the cloud computing, infrastructure, platform, and software services. And four deployment models. I'm pretty sure that you might have heard about this private, public, and hybrid, not about the community cloud. So that is one of the deployment model. Private cloud is actually, you are running a data center, whether your organization or third party is running, only for a particular customer, okay? The customer in the sense, if Exilesoft wants a data center to be managed by someone else and only Exilesoft resources are in that data center, so that is private cloud, okay? It could be managed by Exilesoft or someone else, that's not a problem. Managing party is not the concern, but it is utilized by one single organization. Public, very common, like what you see, anyone can create, you and me, like Azure AWS, it's publicly available cloud. Community cloud is actually, it's a, it's a, it's a unique thing. Uh, I tell it with an example. There is a particular private cloud managed by a third party, but being utilized by more than one organization in terms of some resource sharing. The better example is NASA and uh, US Department of Defense have a same data center, okay? So only they two are the uh, users of that data center. So it's been built on OpenStack and used by the community work of both NASA and the US department. Because they have to share certain data, so they can't do anything. So they have a dedicated center shared among several organizations. So how it differs from public cloud is actually, public cloud is organizations do not share the resources, right? So if your company is developing an application on AWS or Azure, you don't want to share that with another company. But when you started sharing it and it's managed only for that purpose, it's community cloud. Actually, that is not a very famous uh, thing, but there is something like that exists. So be mindful. And based on the definition of the hybrid cloud, that is also very confusing thing. Because uh, people think if I have an application running on cloud, say that I have a website running on cloud, and the database is inside my organization, okay, for that. Web application, the database is inside my organization. Is it hybrid cloud? Is that hybrid? Most of the internet articles actually define that as hybrid. So if you connect an on-prem resource with a cloud somewhere running, it's the entire uh, structure is hybrid. Hybrid is not, it's very simple. Mixing any of those other three is hybrid. Okay, so if an application uses a resource on a community cloud and a public cloud, it becomes a hybrid cloud. Okay, 
But if you have private cloud in your organization, like they are, you are having data center which is managed based on a cloud structure and you are connecting it with a public cloud, then it's hybrid. But you are having a database somewhere on your server in the IT room and connecting it through VPN or whatever the mechanism with another application running on a cloud, it's not based on the NIST definition that is not hybrid. They have clearly mentioned it. So you can go to the NIST site and get the document how they define these things. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So now let's see how uh, companies really adapt to the cloud. This cloud adaptation part. So mainly that organizations, the big uh, big guys. Okay, like uh, let's take examples from Sri Lanka, like uh, uh, companies like uh, enterprise companies like C, Brandix, Haley's, Mars, so something like guys. So they how they adapt. So how the enterprises adapt to the cloud. Because they already have running applications, they have been using the applications for a long time, so they can't easily get into the cloud easily, and they have policies as well. So they do something called, they want to move to the cloud based on some, some concept they've been convinced. Either someone has convinced them, saying cloud is good, cloud is secured, or cloud is cheap. Someone has convinced the CIO, and they want to move to the cloud. So what they do is they take an application running inside their organization, inside their data centers, a VM, and put it in the cloud. So say that you have a web application, okay? So you take the web app, put it in a VM in, in the cloud, and take the database, put it in the VM in the database, and they will be running on cloud. Of course, technically they are running on cloud, but it's called something called lift and shift. You lift it from here and put it there. So you don't do much of the cloud thing, right? So it's a lift and shift mechanism. It is actually, uh, really famous because most enterprises really do that because they can't rewrite the applications uh, specifically for a cloud provider. So they want it up and running quickly. So lift and shift is very famous. And the infrastructure market is the, one of the biggest chunk in the entire cloud market. Okay, That's one of the reasons why Google Platform failed because they never offered infrastructure until very recently. So and that's the reason AWS and Azure picked up. Okay, but the advantage, disadvantage is that it's just nothing like you take an application from your on-prem and put it in the cloud. Start, uh, startups and SMEs, actually they are about to create something. So they can really utilize the features of the cloud platform. Right? Services and whatever the offerings, the pass offerings or service offerings, anything they can really utilize. But I, I hope that you get the meaning, uh, the difference between moving to the cloud and adapting to the cloud, right? That moving is just lift and shift, and adapting is start and using it. It's a better way to think. It's actually uh, you can move with a girl, but adapting her is a bit hard, right? So something like that. Easy to move, hard to adapt. And let's see how. Okay, I'm, uh, let's see that how uh, things work in the adapting scenario. So I want to create a, a small uh, web cart or shopping cart or something. Okay. And I'm going to model it in a AWS. Sorry, Azure. So I use web apps. It's a platform model, so it's easy. And I wanted to use uh, NoSQL, so it's uh, document DB stuff. And um, I want to store the images and my files on block storage. I want to use heavy, very strong encryption, so I use Key Vault and use the relational backend also. So it's ultimately a polyglot solution. And I want to push some notifications, so I use the notification now. Okay, so fine, happy. Same application I want to develop on AWS. So web apps almost equal and Beanstalk, and I want to model it for the DynamoDB and S3. I, I want to use the SNS, the notification services of that. Very, very equal things, actually almost that, though they do the same equal thing, but actually the Azure side and the AWS side. But do you see a problem here? When I, when I started to develop an application like this, do you see a problem? Anyone see a problem in this model? It's not I'm talking like whether uh, block storage is better than S3 or S3 is better than block. But do you see the uh, overall problem here? The more I start utilizing the cloud features, I'm getting locking into that cloud platform. You get locking. So if, if I develop an application on AWS programming uh, for these services, if I ever want to migrate it to another cloud platform, it's a rewrite. I have to significantly do a rewrite. So that is known as cloud locking. 
always cloud vendors push to get you into the cloud locking stuff. Because once you come, you can't go. You have to pay. So that concept is known as cloud locking. So there are articles and everything about cloud locking. So then I want you to consider how you think there's a feature of lift and shift and cloud locking. Lift and shift is quite easy, right? You need it move, and even if you want to move it from Azure to AWS, you can easily move. It's a matter of moving a VM. But when we start adapting something, we are getting attached to it too much, so we can't move it. So that is that is known as cloud locking. So basically, cloud locking is an issue. So deciding between what to choose and what not to choose is up to the decision makers. And you can either use virtual machine or like maybe containers or whatever. So that's easy to move your application, move around. But more the services that you use, you get locked up here. So like concerns. This is the major part I really want to consider. So lift and shift and cloud locking is an issue. So I explained it, right? So other three things, I wanted to share some experiences so that you will get what to consider. And policies really matter when developing on cloud. So whenever a customer comes and I want a solution in a cloud platform, you can easily go through, okay, these are services available and there's something new is coming. So we always tempted with technologies, we use the SDKs and we do it, right? But cloud is somewhere away, mainly talking about public cloud, so policies. Some uh, customers don't want the application to be delivered in all the places. So they want actually, uh, some customers actually, they want the application to run only on specific data center, a uh, specific physical location. So you have to think on the latency issues and how, how to cater with that. Because they have policies, they can't keep their corporate data outside their country or outside their continent or whatever. So that's the issue. Right? And if they want to store something outside their firewall, they need some encryptions and everything. So that is also a part. I, I come and talk with security. And the cost. Cost has been always a decision a deciding factor, whether you are developing for cloud or on-prem. Cost is always a decision making factor, for sure, right? based on the licensing and everything. But when it comes to cloud, cost is a more granular decision making factor. One example I tell, almost all the cloud platforms, Azure, AWS, or whatever, okay, they charge for egress. Egress means when you are taking a data out of, your, of the data center, you have to pay them. All the cloud platforms charge for egress, including Google. Okay. So you think you are developing an application like Instagram or something, like there are, you have lots of reads, okay, uh, binary data, images, and everything. So every time that you read, you are going to get a huge bill. And if you have one million customers, like an application like Instagram, then you might have to think on an offline storage in the mobile device. So that decision really came not because as a feature, but to reduce the cost that decision is being made. So sometimes you have to think the cost in terms of how you decide the application. That's why really they made the, uh, the offline sync. So only to get the new photos, you have to go back. So you don't need to. Otherwise, whether uh, do I want to use a CDN provider? Okay, and some caching decisions came uh, come because of the cost. Because cash, actually, we put the caching because to increase the performance. But when it comes to cloud, we put the cash just to reduce the cost. Another example is actually there is a particular service in Azure. Whenever you talk to that service, you are charged. Okay, so think about a think it think it is a something like a web service. Okay, whenever I make a request to that web service, I'm charged. Each, each request, I'm charged. So I want to cache the data. So if the charge is not there, I don't have introduced the caching in my application. So the cost really changes how you model the application for the platform. So knowing your platform and how it works and how it is being charged is very important when you are really developing a big scale application. And finally, the security. There is very highly confused term with the cloud. Whenever someone or someone talks cloud, there's a rapid question called, what about security? Even the person who asks doesn't know what he's asking, or even the person who's talking he doesn't know what he's talking. There are lots of security risks and benefits with the cloud. The first risk is, the, one of the major concerns of the huge corporations is, like 1,400 companies, 
When they are moving to a public cloud, the application attack surface already increases. For example, say I am a company and uh, I want to move my application to the cloud. I put it on AWS, okay? somewhere in, in, a, in a US data center. And there's another company, maybe say a very big company which is also running the applications on the same data center. A terrorist group or someone, okay, won't really attack that company, not me, but they attack the data center, I am also get affected. Right? So the application surface automatically increases when you're going to a public cloud. So that's one of the reasons some uh, uh, customers have the geographical constraints on the data center limitations where they want to have the data, how they want to have the data. Okay, so that's one risk. Second risk, and mostly this is the very highly talked risk, that is the data security issues. Data security is two, two, type, two types of data, actually. For example, if I put my, say like you have a database, okay, and if I put my DB on a cloud, the first concern is, is it secured? Will anyone hack into the cloud? They can see the data. Right? So they can get the data. So that's one, one concern. And the second concern is, if for me to put it in the cloud, I should trust the cloud provider, right? So if I don't trust Microsoft is going to read my data, I can't put my DB in the cloud, in the Azure. So that's a concern. That's a data security concern. There are things to solve. For example, a funny thing is, when it comes to this uh, binary storage, uh, real example, you can go and check it actually. Azure doesn't provide any encryption, okay? You you can uh, you can upload and if you want to encrypt, you have to do it by yourself and you put it in uh, Azure. And you can have the key in different places, okay? That's a different big topic. Okay, so you have a file, say your tax document of your company and you encrypt it and you put it in the cloud. So what Microsoft Azure says is actually if you really want to Trust. You can trust us, we are not going to read your data, but if you really don't trust, you encrypt and give the data to us. That facility is available, right? AWS is one step further. Actually, they have an option, you can actually enable encryption in S3, okay? They use AES256, I think. Uh, but they have the key. So it's something like, I lock my room and give the key to the thief and say, okay, don't go in. So if they have the key, there is no point whether, of course it's encrypted, but I'm trusting AWS or not is a matter, right? Because they have the key. If they really won't read it, they can read it at any time. And Google also provides very similar, similar things. But AWS is one step good. They also allow you to encrypt it by your own key as well with their own IAM system. Google uses the same uh, one of the low level encryption, AES128. Same thing, they also have the key. And they, they tell, they won't even reveal the, how they keep this uh, key to you. So they are very much into that. Okay? So maybe Google is always going to read the data, right? I don't know, that's why they, they want to do it. But so the options are available, and how you select and how you judge on a platform is really based on you have to go, go through that.